Most Christians today believe in the bodily return of Jesus Christ in the second advent. Literally and visibly, this is the coming of the Lord. However, what's rarely considered or even completely ignored is the coming of Babylon. Professing believers simply don't think it's important. Many would readily admit that Babylon is an adversary in the book of Revelation that apparently exists at the coming of the Lord in the Second Advent War, but that's about it. Even fewer in number, of the more studious sort, would go so far as to acknowledge the eschatological importance of Babylon, the beast, as a signal event that immediately precedes the coming of the Lord. After all, this was repeatedly emphasized by Jesus in Matthew 24 verse 15 and Mark chapter 13 verse 14. When ye therefore see the abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel the prophet, stand in the holy place. Whoso readeth, let him understand. But when ye shall see the abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel the prophet, standing where it ought not, let him that readeth understand. Then let them that be in Judea flee to the mountains. Accordingly, we are instructed to discern the coming of the Lord by discerning the coming of Babylon. Specifically, when the Antichrist is at the helm of power. That's the plain teaching of Jesus in Matthew 24 verse 15 and Mark 13 verse 14. Furthermore, we know that Babylon will be made up of ten kings who commit their power to Antichrist on the fateful day when Jerusalem is invaded for the seizure of the temple. Therefore, at the visible appearance of Babylon in this manner, we can be sure that the coming of the Lord is nigh. This degree of discernment is commendable. Herein we discern the season of the coming of the Lord. This is biblical. We are called by God to discern the season, even though the day and the hour is utterly indiscernible. This is essential. However, we need to discern all that the season brings, not just that it's coming. This requires a higher degree of discernment. Learning to discern the coming of the Lord by discerning the coming of Babylon is just the beginning. Sadly, most students of biblical prophecy don't proceed any further. Learning to acknowledge or recognize the calendared existence of these events isn't enough. That's exactly why so many Christians are dangerously unprepared for what's coming. Woe unto you that desire the day of the Lord. To what end is it for you? The day of the Lord is darkness and not light. Anyone can discern the coming of the Lord by the aforementioned indicators and genuinely disdain the beast before and upon its arrival in real time. Yet, all the while their souls are in grave danger. Even now, if asked, hundreds of millions of Christians would profess an eagerness to see or experience the bodily return of Jesus Christ in the earth. However, According to Amos chapter 5 verse 18, the vast majority of them are utterly deceived. Why? Because the day of the Lord is not what they think. Because very few people are willing to welcome the coming of Babylon as a judgment from God upon the backslidden church. The very idea is repulsive to Christians today. Despite the vast testimony of Holy Scripture on the subject, people don't even give it a second thought. Nevertheless, God's judgment by this means hasn't expired. Indicating this, John beheld Mystery Babylon the Great in Revelation chapter 17 verse 5. Therefore, evidently and urgently, we must come to discern how the Lord works through Babylon to accomplish a redemptive purpose in the earth. Literally, howbeit invisibly, this is to discern the coming of the Lord in the coming of Babylon 
all of which directly precedes the physical invisible coming of the Lord in the second advent. That's why the coming of Babylon is called the day of the Lord in biblical prophecy. Not the day of the devil, nor the day of the heathen, but the day of the Lord. The combined duration of the first invisible coming and the second visible coming, amounting to 1,335 days, is what the spirit of prophecy calls the day of the Lord. From a biblical perspective, this message is undeniable and absolutely overwhelming, despite the ignorance of the masses. It is simply impossible to comprehend the day of the Lord through Babylon if we ignore the tribulation prophets whom God ordained to declare the matter. Ezekiel, being one of these prophets, was made to behold what is normally invisible to men, namely, the departure of the glory of God from the Jews to join the Babylonians. This vision was granted to Ezekiel that all men might understand how the coming of Babylon is in fact the coming of the Lord. Moreover, that's why Jeremiah repeatedly called Babylon's invasion of Judah the Lord's day of visitation. Specifically speaking, God, through Babylon, visited the Jewish people. What is the coming of Babylon? Literally, howbeit invisibly, it's the coming of the Lord. It's when man meets God in the invasion of heathen armies. It's when prophets see the Lord smiting, slaying, searching, and taking captives as in the invasion of Assyria of old. It's when the face of God and the eyes of the Lord directly, especially, and meticulously conduct the seemingly ungovernable chaos of battle. It's when the aftermath of the battle in the totality of destruction accomplished is credited to the presence of the Lord. What is the day of destruction? It's the coming of Babylon as a destruction from the Almighty. It's when the Lord will make preparations to perform an unquantifiable amount of destruction in the earth. This will be accomplished through the divine appointment of destroyers, the likes of which the world has never seen. One's far worse than the destroyer that passed through the land of Egypt on the fateful night of slaughter. One's far more numerous than the destroyer that slew the backsliding murmurers of the church in the wilderness or any generation thereafter. While it is true that the crooked path of backsliders has always been fraught with destroying angels standing in the way, this situation is completely different. This destruction will not be localized or isolated like the six unsparing angels targeted the backslidden church in Judah and marched through Jerusalem of old, each one having a destroying weapon in hand for the slaughter. Literally, over 33 million times greater, suddenly, at the time appointed, 200 million enraged evil angels will be loosed from hell, wherein they were confined for one final rampage of destruction in the earth. In a prophetic scene that threatens destruction beyond human description, lo and behold, Lucifer, the dragon, is divinely allowed to become the king of celestial Babylon. Therefore, upon the opening of hell, which is for the spawning of an army of angels unto his command, Lucifer officially becomes the angel of the bottomless pit, whose name in Hebrew tongue is Abaddon, but in the Greek tongue hath his name Apollyon. Oh, this terrific day of destruction, when torrents of thick darkness ascend from the burning mouth of hell, and proceeding forth from the smoky blackness, locusts. In a situation of foreboding destruction that is absolutely unimaginable and indescribable, lo and behold, the whelming swarm of locusts of old, like in the case of Egypt, human civilizations were wasted by locusts, with no more forewarning than a dark cloud ascending on the horizon that had an appearance of smoke or perhaps a coming rainstorm, 
only to find a locust plague so large it darkened the light of the sun as it approached. If an approaching swarm of earthly locusts can rouse such terror and helpless amazement within mankind, how much more dreadful is an army of evil angels spawned from hell swarming on the horizon after the similitude of a locust plague? Truly, this is a day of darkness. The powerful sting of a scorpion's tail being wielded by the raw appetite of a locust's lifetime of devouring everything green implicates boundless destruction. Before their face the people shall be much pained. All faces shall gather blackness. Many prophets spanning the ages of time caught a glimpse of this army of the future. Having no words to describe the sight, they utilize the rhetoric of metaphors and similitude. It's all written in Holy Scripture for the reader to undergo the same eye-opening experience themselves. While beholding Hell's army swarm in destructive fury, in totality, there we see the army's swiftness in flight and its running stride and appearance, its jaws and teeth in likeness, its invasion and advancement in sound, its power to hurt and kill in analogy, lastly, its insubordination to man and subordination to God in metaphor. This is an army that hungers to hurt and kill mankind like locusts devour green things. This is an ascended horde of enraged devils who conspire to unleash a boundless onslaught of destruction and death upon all mankind like a locust plague leaves nothing green in the wake of its swarm. In action, its marching, patrolling, advancing, and assaulting is unbreachable and infallible. Its persons are both invincible and undying until their work is done, and its strength and energy are both tireless and weariless while every warrior abides sleepless. This is the rise of Babylon in war and conquest. Babylon is firstborn celestially, as described in Revelation chapter 9 verses 1 through 19, and then it is formed terrestrially. Before all is said and done, Babylon shall devour the whole earth and tread it down and break it in pieces. In so doing, Babylon will be like an unstoppable beast that is exceedingly dreadful. For it devoured, break in pieces, and stamped the residue of earthly kingdoms with his feet. Dreadfully so, Babylon is prophetically called the destroying mountain. In very deed, it destroyeth all the earth. All of this and more will force Babylon's dominion upon the inhabitants of the earth. They, being forced into submission, will be made to exclaim, Who is like unto the beast? Who is able to make war with him? What is the day of destruction? It's when the Lord takes credit for all that Babylon is destroying. Professedly and repeatedly, the Lord spoke of what he did through Babylon in explicit language of undeniable clarity. That's why Jeremiah lamented, saying, The Lord was an enemy. He hath swallowed up Israel. He hath destroyed his strongholds. The destroyed survivors are made to understand the doctrine and lament acceptable words in the book of Lamentations. For herein, Babylon is peripheral, and the Lord is front and center amidst the Babylonian captivities of old. What is the day of battle? It's what false prophets will not tell you about. It's what the filthy dreams of sinners would never imagine. It's when God is the hidden and unseen force behind Assyrians, Babylonians, and Medo-Persians of old and anew when they do good or evil. It's when the day of evil is of the Lord. Why? Because evil angels are spawned from hell to punish evil men. And they are all under the ultimate command of a good God who punishes evil men to make them good again. Very boldly, Isaiah says, the Lord of hosts mustereth the hosts of the battle. 
Therefore, when celestial and terrestrial Babylon invades the earth to the punishment of the backslidden church, in actuality, God will invade with his troops, professedly and explicitly, with the locust-like army of hell in view, God called it my great army. This is the battle in the day of the Lord. This is the battle in the day of the Lord the false prophets refuse to speak about. Literally, howbeit invisibly, the coming of Babylon is the coming of the Lord. Therefore, as the armies of hell furiously advance in battle, Rightly instructed onlookers will regard it as an operation of heaven. Even as Nebuchadnezzar was humbled before the watchers of heaven and afterward was made to confess, the heavens do rule. The furious swarms of hellish warriors are beckoned by God with a hiss. They fly to him swiftly as a bird to execute the counsel of the Lord and nothing more. Why? because the devils tremble before the presence of the Lord as he is presiding over them as the commander. Even as Joel testified under inspiration, saying, And the Lord shall utter his voice before his army, for his camp is very great, for he is strong that executeth his word, for the day of the Lord is great and very terrible, and who can abide it? This is a very real delegation of destructive authority that is majestic, miraculous, celestial, and meticulous. Therefore, to stop the onslaught of manslaying justice, the angels' hands must be stayed from destroying the people. God's majesty prevails through the invisible channels of authority in a seemingly uncontrollable superstructure. Therefore, what is done by angels is duly regarded as an act of God. Who smote the people? God through angels did. Hence, God is able to employ unholy angels in the causes of divine justice while they remain unaware of their divine appointment, just like the historical armies of Assyria and Babylon were so used. Speaking of the divine usage of God on this wise, it was said of the king of Assyria, Howbeit he meaneth not so, neither doth his heart think so but it is in his heart to destroy and cut off nations, not a few. God has employed Satan in the service of the kingdom for centuries, only this time the scope of his role is radically increased. These evil angels join with evil men to form an earthly and terrestrial empire made up of the worst of the heathen. Together they will be a bitter and hasty nation, a people that are both terrible and dreadful, this is a nation of fierce countenance, whose people are cruel and have no mercy. They are like their leader, the Antichrist, a king of fierce countenance who smites the peoples of the earth in wrath with a continual stroke. This is a day of wrath. This son of perdition is the oppressor foretold of old, who will make war with the saints and prevail through the aid of craft and dark sentences concocted by Lucifer. The affliction suffered by the church will be exceedingly abundant in these days of great tribulation. Notwithstanding, worst of all, God said, My soul shall abhor you. And I will show wonders in the heavens and in the earth, blood and fire and pillars of smoke. What is the day of judgment? It's the day of the Lord. It's the coming of Babylon in a day of destruction through the violence of battle. It is clear that Babylon will act independently and unconsciously of God under the direct inspiration of Satan via the forbidden crafts of divination and such like things. And upon ultimate success, after all is said and done according to what was foretold and that the Antichrist shall destroy wonderfully, the bewitched Antichrist will ascribe power and glory to a false god for what was accomplished. This being the case, however, it is also true that Babylon will act dependently upon the Lord insomuch that Babylonians can do nothing without him. Therefore, to compel men to look beyond the visible presence of Babylon, God said, I, even I, am against thee speaking on behalf of what God was doing to the backslidden church through Babylon. 
This is the strange work of the Lord. The celestial and terrestrial kings and kingdoms of Babylon do act profoundly independent and unconscious of God, insomuch that they make war against Him. Albeit, meanwhile, God is profoundly and meticulously involved insomuch that He calls the kings of Babylon my servant. How can it be? Verily, God is profoundly removed from and innocent of all of Babylon's wretchedness, and yet, simultaneously, He is profoundly near and responsible for what is happening. Literally, heaven rules hell. At first glance, we read that they had a king over them, but in full scope we read in the selfsame events, God is saying, with a mighty hand will I rule over you. I will cause you to pass under the rod. I will bring you into the bond of the covenant. The average man looks up at the highest tier of terrestrial rule and sees the Antichrist. The witch looks up at the highest tier of celestial rule and sees Lucifer. The prophet looks up at the highest tier of terrestrial and celestial rule and sees the Lord of hosts. For when the earth is overtly displaced into the diabolical rule of Satan via Babylon because of the divine sentence, I will forsake you. The situation is far from divine abandonment in any human estimation. When God calls the king of Babylon Lucifer and also my servant, he is underscoring the universal truth that all celestial and terrestrial happenings are first of all and after all a service to God. In other words, the immaterial and material kings, armies, and governments of Babylon are God's servants and services. As we have observed, Babylon's celestial and terrestrial forces are destroyers raised up by God for destruction as the hammer of the whole earth, even as a golden cup in the Lord's hand that made all the earth drunken. Yea, and because of the Lord's hand in it all, God said to the targeted peoples of Babylon's fury, I have wounded thee with the wound of an enemy, with the chastisement of a cruel one. Marvelously, God's eyes control the celestial eyes, which also control Babylon's eyes in the acts of war, conquest, and government. Or, God's judgments control the angelic judgments, which also control Babylon's judgments in the acts of war, conquest, and government. And to the others he said in my hearing, Go ye after him through the city and smite. Let not your eyes spare, neither have ye pity. Slay utterly, old and young, both maids and little children and women but come not near any man upon whom is the mark, and begin at my sanctuary. Then they began at the ancient men which were before the house. And as for me also, mine eye shall not spare, neither will I have pity, but I will recompense their way upon their head. The Babylonians and all the Chaldeans, Pekod and Shoah, Koah and all the Assyrians with them, all of them desirable young men, captains and rulers, great lords and renowned, all of them riding upon horses. And they shall come against thee with chariots, wagons and wheels, and with an assembly of people, which shall set against thee buckler and shield and helmet round about. And I will set my judgment before them, and they shall judge thee according to their judgments. And I will set my jealousy against thee, and they shall deal furiously with thee, they shall take away thy nose and thine ears, and thy remnant shall fall by the sword. They shall take thy sons and thy daughters, and thy residue shall be devoured by the fire. When God said, speaking to the church, I will do these things unto thee, what did he mean? When God in retrospect said, according to their way and according to their doings have I judged them, what did he mean? Evidently, this meant that God set his own judgment before Babylon as eyes to the head, so that according to prophecy, Babylon's judgment became God's judgment. 
and all of this means the fulfillment of the divine threat to the church, I will set my jealousy against thee, which in turn means Babylon shall deal furiously with thee. These be the days of vengeance. This transferable exchange of judgment from God to the terrestrial forces of Babylon is harmonious with the missing link in the exchange, God's use of the celestial. Thus, we observe the same harmonious relationship existing in God's use of the celestial determining how the celestial controls the terrestrial. So, when God spoke of his judgment of the backsliders of the church in retrospect, saying, according to their way and according to their doings, I judged them, this meant that Babylon judged the church accordingly, as it was written, according to thy ways and according to thy doings shall Babylon judge thee, saith the Lord God. Then, shockingly, after it was all said and done, Babylon ascribes honor to a false god and pays tribute to breathless idols. Can you believe it? This testifies to the fact that the demonic element of Babylon's celestial and terrestrial armies maintain an insubordinate subjection to God, and by nature are at enmity against the righteousness of God's judgments the whole time. And yet all of God's will is still accomplished via the dynamic of an ongoing war in the heavenlies as God uses heaven's army to rule over hell's army. Amazingly, and as a manifest token of the aforementioned heavenly conflict, God guided the sword of Babylon even as the king of Babylon consulted devils via the use of divination. Evidently, therefore, the surety of God's success in the celestial warfare between holy and unholy angels is both calculated and impeccably exact. God's judgment, not the devils or the antichrists. And say to the land of Israel, Thus saith the Lord, Behold, I am against thee, and will draw forth my sword out of his sheath, and will cut off from thee the righteous and the wicked. Seeing then that I will cut off from thee the righteous and the wicked, therefore shall my sword go forth out of his sheath against all flesh from the south to the north, that all flesh may know that I the Lord have drawn forth my sword out of his sheath. It shall not return any more. Sigh therefore, thou son of man, with the breaking of thy loins, and with bitterness sigh before their eyes. And it shall be when they say unto thee, Wherefore sighest thou, that thou shalt answer, for the tidings, because it cometh, and every heart shall melt, and all hands shall be feeble, and every spirit shall faint, and all knees shall be weak as water. Behold, it cometh, and shall be brought to pass, saith the Lord God. I myself will fight against you with an outstretched hand and with a strong arm, even in anger and in fury and in great wrath. The chaos of seemingly uncontrollable battle is a divinely set stage of God's judgment. Obviously, who could doubt the marksmanship of the sword of the Lord? Herein God is the one doing the fighting and smiting. Resistance is futile. The Lord renders the backslidden church helpless and gives it into the hands of Babylon. Marvelously, what Babylon does then is in accordance with the judgment of God who is directing its hands. Literally, God is actively strengthening the arms of Babylon and breaking the arms of resistors. Meticulously, in the very throes of warfare, God is turning back the weapons of war in the hands of resistors who fight against Babylon while placing the sword of the Lord into the hands of Babylon. Therefore, when Babylon breaks the bones of the backslidden church, we are to understand that God broke the bones. Babylon's forces will not deviate from the divine targets. Babylon's army is God's purifying apparatus, and through them the divine saying is fulfilled, I will search. Backslidden Christians hide from Babylon, hoping to escape all in vain. Babylon is God's net or snare that's alive like a ravenous bird. It lives and breathes to execute, God said, my counsel, and the Lord is in hot pursuit of church purity. Hence, 
fortified cities to strengthen their defenses, and hereby they essay to make their walls unbreachable by the armies of Babylon. But meanwhile God is saying, I will assemble Babylon into the midst of this city. The bloodthirsty faces of heathen soldiers do ride forth to smite the inhabitants of the city. And meanwhile, God says, I will smite the inhabitants of this city. And I myself will fight against you with an outstretched hand and with a strong arm, even in anger and in fury and in great wrath. In so doing, God says, I have set my face against this city for evil. The truth be told, because God will not spare, the soldiers of Babylon will not spare. God will comfort himself in the exacting of divine justice through Babylon. But until then, the anger of God will not abate or diminish. What's in God's mind will be in Babylon's mind in respect to the decisive blows of the war that determine life and death. The conquests of war and the government of Babylon as a whole was and will be the work of the Lord. This is a judgment from God. Conclusively, there is nothing that men can do to escape it. The only safe option is to embrace it. Come day 1260, God's judgment through Babylon will be accomplished. Then. From day 1260 to day 1335, God will judge Babylon, liberate the Jews, convert every living survivor among them, and then regather and restore the Jews to Jerusalem for the commencement of the millennial reign of Christ. Herein, the majesty of the Lord will transition from an invisible majesty into a visible majesty, while both scenarios must be regarded as the coming of the Lord. Beware, my reader, lest any man tell you otherwise. The day of the Lord is at hand.